Hello, YouTube. My name is David uh, at Cyber Dave Tech. Uh, I have a uh, Matt Lee for my for my special guest today. Um, I'd like to bring him on the show and let him and uh, and Matt. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into cybersecurity. Well, I think I probably paid a saint's ransom or something to be my supposition. Uh, no, my name's uh, Matt Lee. Um, I started out in, in technology about 11 years ago, came from the banking industry uh, and, you know, worked in virtually every single position in IT at a managed service provider as we grew from, you know, seven employees to 170 and, um, you know, found a real high affinity for cybersecurity and education around cybersecurity, you know, over the last five years. And uh, that's kind of what I've, I've spent my, my time doing uh, is educating uh, people around the, you know, cybersecurity. And what drives me is that my children will not have the same experience in life as I had if we do not stem the flood of loss from both uh, intellectual property, uh, monetary and just overall confidence in our in our technology systems in the United States. And, and, you know, when I say that, I see this daunting challenge in front of us, right, where most people don't think about security first, don't think about the things they need to do to protect themselves. And oftentimes it's a, an expense instead of an investment in their minds. And so uh, it's kind of what brings me here. But uh, thanks for letting me introduce myself. I'm just a just an IT guy turned cybersecurity and now I collected letters. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right um i just have a few uh just different different random questions for all right you. Um, and uh as far as like inventory management uh how important do you think it is uh to be great at inventory uh management when it comes to your org organization it's huge, uh, right? So, you know, one of the things that almost all cybersecurity frameworks start with is know thyself, right? Uh, and if I rewind that even further, you know, security is really all about the CIA triad, right? Which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so when you're starting to think of that, you're, you're talking from the position of data, right? right? So security is data. Security is where's my data? How much is it worth? And what's my regulatory requirement? What's my risk? What, what happens if I lose this, Right. And so mm -hmm. if you start thinking about that, you sure as shit can't protect it if you don't know what's accessing it, <laughs> right? right? And so right. you find yourself in a position where uh, my lovely assistant just got to pop out. She, she's, uh, <laughs> she's with me in the hotel here in Boston this week. Um, but, you know, if you don't know where your assets are, if you don't know where the inventory is of what's touching your data, and you don't have the inventory of what data exists and what it's worth, you really aren't doing security. You're doing security theater. Right. You're putting up tools, you're installing antiviruses, but you're doing it with no intent. You're doing it with no ubiquitousness. Right. You don't have it somewhat you know, defined across an entire space. Um, and so you end up not really doing anything except for making yourself feel good until the threat actors win. Um, so short story is I think inventory <laughs> is probably one of the more critical pieces because you, you got to know thyself first. Right. I think, I think the inventory, a lot of people over, overlooks that, how, how important that it actually is. Yeah. That's why and, I thought I'd ask you, you know, well, your and, thoughts. It, and if you can, it shouldn't be an Excel sheet, right? It shouldn't be something you just, you know, try to track down manually. One of the things that I worked really hard on, and I used a lot of Azure Active Directory, I used conditional access policies and things and to bring it into Intune as well. But if an asset touches my data, I want it to automatically be inventoried. I want it to automatically have its tools deployed. I want it to automatically start to exist in an inventory system. I want it to automatically start being tracked for compliances, right? I don't want humans to fail. We suck, right? We're, <laughs> we're not good at delivering the same results over and over again. It's just part of human nature. We have variances in our capacitance, right? I know, like, um, right. <laughs> like you said, a lot of people, companies use Excel sheets. Of course, yep. we use uh, WASP, you know, WASP. Okay. Yeah, sure. Management. Yep, it's really, sure. really nice. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely, you know, when, when people think of security, one of the challenges is that it's somewhat paradoxical. You have all these vendors out there saying, you know, security is my product. Security is this. You know, and if you install this antivirus, you'll never have a problem again. Mm -hmm. 
well, it doesn't matter if you don't put the antivirus on the system, right? Um, and, and they're kind of telling lies in the way that that even really is true. In fact, most antiviruses are 80, 90 percent efficacious, right? Like they're not they're not perfect. Um, and yet the vendors go and say, oh, yeah, we'll stop everything. We're good. Um, and, and some of that marketing has got to stop, in my opinion. So breakfast just arrived for the room service. It's, it's oh, not nice. <laughs> That's um, actually another question that I was going to ask you sure. about. Um, oh, what you're talking about uh, anti-virus protection businesses uh, as far as malware. Uh, what what are the biggest uh, misconceptions in uh, cybersecurity today? Boy, howdy! You know, cybersecurity today. It's it's a bit of a farce, right? Uh, whether it's antivirus, you know, whether it's uh, you know the word AI started getting tossed into everything for a couple of years, right? Like you know every every antivirus vendor now is an AI vendor, and we use machine learning. We get, and I think those are all true. I think there there are things where the machine learning indices are going to find things that they haven't found before. They're going to look for patterns. They're going to find methods. But what people don't understand is these threat actors reinvent methods. These threat actors use TTPs that we track, right? Techniques, tactics, and practices that we track. And those things are all about the concertedness and capabilities of the threat actor you face. What, what people need to start thinking about from a security perspective, whether it be antivirus or whatever, is it's about risk. It's about risk reduction. If I use this product, I can reduce the risk by 85%, mm -hmm. Right. But you're yeah. never going to stop a concerted threat actor. Mm -hmm. David, if I wanted to attack you, I'd go so far as to get hired at your organization. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. th there's things where, you know, if you want to stop a real concerted threat actor, you probably can't. But you can reduce the risk of it happening from the threat actors that aren't as concerted and the threat actors that aren't as good and the threat actors that are script kiddies like me. Right? The people that, that have some capacitance but are really just looking for that low-hanging fruit. So, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions, I guess, in our industry is that the belief that you can be protected. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm not trying to be negative. But in the same way, I know that if I'm going to go do high level BMX, I'm going to break something. I'm going to hurt myself. I'm going to be injured. And I wear knee pads. Why do I need wear knee pads? So I can hope not to break my fucking knee. Right. And <laughs> why do I wear? And, and so you start getting into this where cybersecurity is approached in a way like we could stop everything. Medicine isn't approached oh. that way, right? I, I can reduce the impacts of this stroke. I can give you supplemental oxygen to make up for the fact that you're not taking on enough oxygen. You have alveoli problems. But at the end of the day, I understand it's a zero-sum game, right? I understand that I'm going to gain some and I'm going to lose some. And we in our industry talk about security like it's a faux pas that should never happen. You should never be compromised. You should never have a breach. You should No, you should try to reduce it. You should right. be defensible in how you tried to reduce it. You should be able to prove to others you did what most common people would do, um, but you can't win. Uh, and, and, and everybody called that FUD for a while, right? I don't know if you've heard the term <laughs> fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But I'm really trying to paint honesty. In the same way, if I told you to go down that half pipe on your BMX bike at six years old, and I don't tell you, hey, there's a chance you might bust your ass. Maybe you should wear a helmet. I'm an idiot, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> right. And um, that's what I say too, as far as like um, organization, uh, as far as breach, breach, you know, breaches happening. I mean, we can we can stop the bleeding, but, mm -hmm. but a lot of times, you know, it's not. It, of course, like you said, it's not going to go like completely away. It's right. Just, it's just not. And and I think a lot of people, uh, like you said, you know, they they don't they don't under, they don't understand that. They don't uh, completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when they go through it, it also doesn't seem to provide the understanding. And what I mean by that is every person I've had had an incident that turned into potentially a breach. And, you know, I don't like to use the word breach unless I know for sure. And I tell people, when can you use the word breach? When you're either the person that's going to sit on the stand and defend that it's a breach, or you're the person with the juris doctorate after your name that says you're going to write it down, <laughs> right? Like that's kind of the points when you'd use the word breach, I guess, in any definition. But, you know, once I've seen a company go through that, I've still never had them walk the other side and go, wow, I need to harden myself in a way that I can take these losses, find them earlier. Just Nope. They go, how could this never happen again? I, if, I, if I told you I could make it never happen again, I'm lying to you. But if I could make it to where we find it earlier, reduce the bleeding, as you said, 
keep it from spreading into other body cavities, right? If I can stop it from getting worse, if I can do the triage just like a paramedic would do, but do it faster because I have better tools, because I have better medicine, right? Which one would you rather have trying to save your life? Somebody rolling out on the Western Front in the 1900s or someone rolling out with a modern ambulance today from a triage perspective, right? It certainly would be the modern ambulance because the tools are better, the capabilities are better, the education is better, the understanding of the goal of the human body and what does this and what does that is better, right? In 1915, we basically knew how to saw your leg off. That was, that was pretty well the extent of her, right? I mean, it wasn't super modern medical practice. And so, you know, I would say that that much like cybersecurity needs to understand that the where the data is, how it's accessed, all the multitudes of humans that touch it, and, and misconceptions in in the industry, and and uh, we had kind of landed on the the fact that you know people don't adjust the way of thinking, and I think part of that's our fault, right? Part of that is that as educators, we need to do a better job of just saying the reality of what we're facing. You know, I've, I've used this phrase many times before on presentations, but you know, my doctor doesn't sit in the waiting room, him and hawn over the income they're going to make trying to decide whether or not they want to lose a patient and tell me, hey, Matt, you, you're fat and you have high blood pressure. If you don't deal with it, you're going to die like a fat man with high blood pressure, right? <laughs> and, and no, he comes in and just says it. Now, he might deliver it more tactfully and he might be nice about it. But if I don't take my medicine, he's sure going to document that he told me. He's sure going to document that we had this conversation. He's sure going to document that I'm being noncompliant. Why? Because he don't want to lose his license, right? And he wants to be a right. practitioner. And so, you know, we have to start being better about being prescriptive we have to start being better as an industry about explaining to people the reality of it in words they can understand, in analogies if necessary. I'm an analogy engine. I love making analogies, <laughs> right? But we've got to be able to bring it in a way that people can understand. And we've got to be able to raise that tide of what their understanding is and their capabilities are. Most of the time, it's hearts and minds, right? Like if you think about it, which one would I be better off doing? Putting new antivirus on and leaving administrative rights or putting on just defender and taking away administrative rights. Well, hell, if I was given that choice, I would absolutely use Windows Defender and take away admin rights because I'd have a much more hardened posture. And oh, yet yeah. every conversation is on, well, I got to spend for the Sentinel One or I got to spend for the CrowdStrike or I got to spend for the... True. I think those are valuable, but you can't ignore the hearts and minds decision to take away admin rights. Most <laughs> people don't do that because why? It'd be a pain in the ass on the IT staff, right? Right. It's kind of like people, people trying to, trying to give, uh, uh, make you, or they want you to uh, like, well, why, why can't we, we have it, uh, admin, right? That's, that's a big, a big, no, a hard, no. Well, you and know, most companies, people. most companies, small to mid-sized business, most MSPs do not take away local admin rights. They don't. And, and if I was a threat actor and I get on, I can undermine most tools. Just by being administrative, right? I can use that capability to, to cut underneath them. So. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I completely agree with uh, cyber awareness ed education. I know a lot of a lot of companies. They're just like educating their employees, like what wants to wants to every year. <laughs> yeah, or one fishing test every maybe every one month fishing or test. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they should have it like at least at least every two to three months at min minimum. Yeah, that, that and, way and instructor drills. led, right? Classes, right. questions, and, interaction, and it drills that you know into their. <laughs> that yeah. way, that way they don't get out of a habit of. Uh, Yep. Keep them, keep them on their toes, so, so to speak. <laughs> right. Well, and, yeah. lock your machines and do these hygienic things. Don't sign in from devices. And, and also on the other side of that, David, we as administrators have to convince our boards, convince our structured you know, uh, uh, command chain what we need to do and help educate them in, in that and say, okay, listen, it's not just a fishing test. That's just not enough. I mean, is that where most things come from? Sure. Right. It is definitely from email, but there's so many other things they need to be aware of. I mean, how many people talk to their employees about their own Facebook, their own house, Facebook, their own personal Facebook? Well, Matt, why would that matter? Well, if I want to extort a company into doing what I want, I might just be able to extort the humans. Right. I might just be able to attack the humans that are not at work and then use those things to attack them. Right. Do you use it either through extortion, OSINT information gathering? Or, or simply just absolutely use that same password that they're probably using for work. It's the same password they're using for Facebook. And when I trick them out of that <laughs> Facebook password, I'm going to use it at work, right? Like, you know, 
<laughs> uh, we got to educate them, though, to your point. And I think more frequently and better education around more things. You know, when I was at Iconic IT, we bought 170 uh, 2FA tokens, right? We, we bought 170 mm. Duo or, uh, you know, YubiKey Fido tokens. And the intent was, I don't ever want them back. They're not our property. They're yours. Go secure your Facebook. Go secure your Google. Go secure your stuff with as much two-factor as you can. It's not tied to a cell phone system, right? You know, I don't know if you saw the Coinbase attack last week, but, you know, they, they took $24,000 from this one couple that, you know, had two-factor on and everything. They were just doing, you know, uh, SMS hammering. Yeah, right? I seen so. I seen that. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, crazy how much information that um, O sent. You know, skill that you can that people they just don't don't realize. How well, much and everybody thinks there. I live in Utah, but I just I just <laughs> instead of putting out good clean OSINT data, I just decided to pollute my OSINT data with bad data too. <laughs> 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 but anyways, right. I get so many job offers for Utah. I was like, I don't even know that, that city I put in there even exists. Like I made it up. Like I just <laughs> typed in a city in Utah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I've had people that live in Utah go, where's that at, madam? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh, maybe rewind a little bit. And All right. Uh, it'll be asking instead of the technical side of uh, sure. cybersecurity. How about how about people that's uh, non-technical? Uh, what kind of uh, roles would you uh, would you recommend? Like, uh, let's say, how are they a lot of non-technical roles in cybersecurity as well? There, there are. I mean, one of the things about cybersecurity is that it's a um, circular in some ways, right? You you come up with a plan, you exec execute that plan, and you damn well better be auditing that plan. Mm -hmm. And so I think that where I would say if I was coming into cybersecurity and I didn't have a huge amount of breadth of knowledge from a technical perspective, you know, there's there's the educator role, right, where you're, where you're teaching about some of the cybersecurity miscom you know, common attack methods. That doesn't have mm. to be very technical. In fact, it's almost better if they can connect with people and just discuss what the prescriptive actions are. But in the same breath, auditing. Right. Somebody that's in compliance or managing the audits or managing the internal auditing firms and getting the data back and forth and, you know, those type of things, notification space like around around that, all of those type of things. Incident response in some degrees is, is not necessarily going to be a technical role. It's got some aspects that are technical, obviously, but, you know, mm -hmm. someone managing that and, and dealing with the incidents and writing up the incidents and determining breach notifications. And so, you know, I think there's there's a lot of space for entry positions in cyber that are around that auditing side. Now take it with a grain of salt in the sense that, you know, a good auditor can smell the BS in, in the technical, if they understand the technical too. So I think that's a bit of the, right. the challenge. Um, but someone coming in with not a huge amount of technical, you know, back end probably stays in mostly those spaces, in my opinion. Um, I'm sure there's things I've left off and, you know, that's why it takes all of us, right? <laughs> we all only have one view, but my thought would be it'd certainly be an auditing and compliance would be where I'd probably say to start there. What's nice about that is then you'll start seeing the evidence gathering. You'll start seeing what has to be, you know, required to meet the, the requirements. Um and so I think you tangentially start to learn a bit about cybersecurity and the pieces of it. Um, the other side of it is like writing policy, right? And how you apply it and, and what the operational aspects of that, that would not necessarily be tech technical. I mean, you start, certainly have to understand what pieces you're turning, what wrench you got, but, um, but I would say that's some, maybe another space where that would come out as in policy uh, writing and enumeration, like making sure we have the right operational policies to follow this policy and make sure they're being actually done. Right. I can't tell you how many people have a fantastic incident response plan and do nothing with it. <laughs> right. So that's a good entry, maybe entry, but right, to get your foot foot into security yeah. if you wanted to move into something else, yep. you know, pivot late later. Um, how about uh, how about threat threat intelligence? Let's say somewhere like uh, working for uh, maybe let's say recorded future, you know, like right like writing up reports, things like that. Would you maybe consider that a um, entry level? To Pro probably. I think the challenges at some point, and this, again, you know, everybody's got opinions, so I could be wrong. But I think some of the challenges become understanding the threat intelligence and understanding what it means to somebody that would be challenging in that regard, right? Like if you don't have a technical background and you hear log4j, 
Right. right. You would have a different understanding than if you hear Log4j and you have a technical background. You're like, holy shit, every single repo, I think there were 470,000 repos that depended on Log4j. Right. And then on top of that, how many of them are companies that don't even tell you what's in their soup? Right. You don't even know what's been placed in that in that broth. Right. And so you right. don't have any visibility as to whether or not they're using Log4j and you don't have visibility as whether they're pwned or not right now. So I think that's where you get limitations in the technical writing, technical kind of um, threat intelligence. Now, if you were building systems to process threat intelligence or you're building systems, you just have a different technical capability, right? But you might not understand the data being fed there, right? You might not understand some of that. So take it with a grain of salt, but I would probably say that's probably not the entry point. Um, uh, I think Catalan, Simpanow, or whoever, uh, is what, <laughs> how you say that, with a recorded future, like it takes some nuance to be able to write editorialization towards something because you have to understand what it means first. Um, you have to, and so, great example. Right. Understand uh, what it means. And you have to, like you said, keep up, keep up with these threats every, every day. <laughs> I, I keep one whole eye on it. You know, I can only see oh, out of yeah. the other eye, but I keep this eye on it over here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's see. I, I have a few, couple more, couple more questions for you. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, how important do you think uh, networking? Let's say, for for instance, you know, like what we're doing, like networking on. Oh, the, human like, networking. Link, link, or human. Yeah. yeah let's yeah. say, <laughs> let's say, human, human networking. Yeah. Like, how important do you think it is in the, uh, um, well, any any career. Uh, now, say, so let's take it away cyber. from cyber, right? Yeah. You know, my my dad, my dad, when I was a very young man, used two phrases all the time, right? He said, "Nothing works <laughs> like a network." <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and it's not about what you know, it's who you know sometimes. Um, and so I, I would say that, you know, as humans, we are um, we are animals. Uh, we do have social constructs. We do have certain social needs. We do have those things. And I think that if you go and give, if you just mm-hmm. go and give, if you take the time to care about others, to give your talents where they're necessary, to not shove things down people's throats where it's not right. And just learn that human aspect. You know, I think you'll get more in return than you can possibly put out ever. Right. That's the reason I do these things. It's the reason I have these conversations with people like you, David, is that I just feel like, you know, if I've got it, what makes us uniquely human, unlike a dog, is that when my child is born, they can learn things without spending a lifetime learning them the first time. They can go read it in a book. They can have someone teach them. They can have someone take them through an apprenticeship. They could learn something that would take humans and has taken humans their own lifetimes to figure out. Marie Curie died for radiation study, right? Like we have all these things that kind of, you know, built up and that's very unique about humans. So to bring that all the way back to networking, why would you go network with humans? This is the only way you're going to learn the things that are not in a book you could find that you might find from what David learned about life and what Matt learned about life. And so I'd say it's probably one of the most important things you can do because it'll help you gain contextual awareness of things from other people's perspective, right? So I would say right. networking is big. I would also say that when you're trying to break into any role, you never know when the person you're talking to might already have a need that's not necessarily said well or you can't see and you're like, oh, I have a job for you, right? And so I would say <laughs> networking like this is is huge. It also shows interest, right? To some degree, it shows Willingness to learn. I know Josh kind of Mason has gone off about this a couple times on LinkedIn where he's like, you know, people reach out and want me to tell them these things and I've already made a hundred thousand videos of it. Right. Right. Like I, you know, I, I've already got all the content. It's already put up. I can tell you how to get started. I can do all these things. Then come back and talk to me. Right. And I'm paraphrasing what I've read, you know, out, out loud, but, or, you know, from, from his LinkedIn and such. But, you know, the, the point is, is that there's so many people that are willing to give, but they want to see that people have taken an initiative towards gaining some of that knowledge, right? Like I won't respond to a salesperson or somebody that's trying to network with me that hasn't done any research about who I am, that hasn't spent two minutes going, I'm about to reach out to this dude. Let me figure out what he's about. And and and, and it's in the video, but, you know, it's just in the sense that, you know, I think someone reached out to him for some counseling or something. He's like, man, I've, I've got like, I've got a hundred videos of things I've made for this, like to, to help you down this path, you know? And what I was, what I went on to say was for me, especially, I just want someone to take a few minutes to, to look and, you know, research who I am before they reach out, right? And, and or, or have followed me or something, have looked at it. But, you know, if salespeople come out and, you know, miscategorize me or haven't done any research or I get the template letter, like that's not networking, right? Networking is showing a personal interest, 
reaching out, learning something about the individual, consuming some of their content, asking intelligent questions about their content, particularly, right? Like if you have that kind of concern. Um, but networking to the very beginning point was, you know, probably one of the biggest things you can do, <clears throat> at least to learn and find out what you want to do, right? Maybe you, you go, I want to be in cyber, but you don't have any definition of what that means. You know, it might help to follow people that might be in those positions, right? So a threat researcher or, you know, somebody like me who just talks for a living and probably doesn't know very much. Um, you know, so you have, you have all these different types of, of humans um, to, to follow in the cyberspace and figure out what you want to do. And I think the best way to do that is networking. Um, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree. Uh, I love networking and getting my hands, you know, on as much things as, as possible. Oh, I'm a kinesthetic oh. learner, right? Like, I got to <laughs> use these. I can't read it. I got to do it. Right. <laughs> but uh, what, wouldn't work much for a bomb tech, right? Like kinesthetic <laughs> learning as a bomb tech is probably not the best methodology. <laughs> 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 yeah um i've got uh, maybe before we go uh but you know maybe one or two more questions all righty and um one of my another thing i was gonna say before we go uh what what was your uh let's go over i know you introduced yourself and uh sure. but, but what was your like main mission like if you had one thing you know that you wanted to um accomplish in the cybersecurity field or maybe a personal uh, accomplishment, the goals that you would like to set? Uh, is there anything? Well, it's kind of tangential to what my mission is at PAX 8 right now, right? You know, think of it this way. When someone goes to sell you antivirus, they sold you antivirus because you need antivirus. Okay. Who's the smartest guy in the room? Who's the one picking that? Who's the one saying that that's not the way we should do this, right? We should adhere to some framework. We should basically say, why do I use malware prevention? Well, because CIS 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3 are very prescriptive into how I should deploy malware prevention. Also, CIS 10.4 says I probably ought to take away your flash drives, right? I probably ought. And so you start getting into these things where if I follow these 56 controls from CIS, then I'll reduce the risk by the bell curve. I'll reduce 85% of the risk by simply doing all of these good practices. And guess what? Some of them are money. Some of them aren't money. Back to your first question for me. Some of them are inventory management. Some of them are, right, where's my data? Some of them are, do yeah. I have AV? Do I have admin rights? Do I have good email protection? Do I? Have... Those are all basic stuff we've all been saying. All of us have been saying it. The difference is when we say it, we're saying it because I'm smart, because I know things, because I'm good, because I'm... But when you translate that, it really should be, why does a doctor say I should take penicillin? Because there have been a lot of tests. They understand what it does. They understand its efficacy. They understand its m mean failures for humans that have problems with it. They, all those things are part of some prescriptive action that they've taken from, from modern medicine practice. We too should have a guide. Um, and so what I'm doing at, at PAX 8 is we're realigning all of our security sales engineers. We're realigning all of our, 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 our account managers to speak in CIS right? To speak. And why do you need email backup? Because there's a control that says you need backup of things that you have data in, right? Like, like these basic things. And what I think will come from that is the ability to go down to downstream. And if I teach MSPs how to learn CIS and how to talk about CIS, how to align their world with CIS, and I teach the vendors how to tie their stuff to CIS so I can use it and how to write the policy blurbs that need to go along with it that make it true. But if I can do those things, then when the MSP goes to talk to the client, when they go to walk into that executive leader or they go to walk into that small to mid-sized business and they say, hey, here's the 18 things we need to do in the CIS family of controls. We do six of these for you. There's 12 more that need to be tackled, including multi-factor, single sign-on. There's all these other things. Why don't we set up next quarter to do a project for these and next quarter to do a project for these and next? And you start getting a roadmap that's defensible. And if someone says no, I can say, listen, you understand you're saying no to one eighteenth of what should be done to protect yourself right now. Okay. I'm going to document that just like Matt not taking his blood pressure medicine. <laughs> and when you keel right. over dead, I'm going to have defensibility of my actions. Right. And I, I think that's what my big call is, is that people should start aligning to a framework, start building documentation for defensibility, right. And should start making defensible actions and choices in security. Um, so my, my mission is to help use us to align to that so that we can educate MSPs to speak to their clients in the same way. So that's my personal mission. 
uh, this year. Anyway, <laughs> once more into the breach, dear friend. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I, uh, I hate that your internet keeps breaking up. That's uh, that I would be very frustrated. Might even be throwing things. You never know. Like when the camera's back and dark, I might be tossing stuff around in the house. <laughs> But yeah, I was just uh, getting ready to to say, Matt, that uh, we appreciate you know everything that you do, and uh, it sounds like you're doing an awesome job at, at work, and just keep doing what you're doing, man. And and Thank uh, you, brother, oh yeah, yeah, you're you're, you're well. I, I fail a lot. I just throw enough at the wall that some of it sticks. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. We all we all we all fail sometimes but i mean that's okay <laughs> I'm telling we you. get we get right back up we get keep getting getting up Is and, it? Uh, well i'm pleased to have you in my circle and and i i, I I'm, I'm honored to be on your new youtube channel and you know let me know if i can ever help you anyway my friend so. all right thank thank you matt i'm honored to, to have you and uh if you need anything just reach out and uh of course sure to either will. You know me or uh, Matt, and we'll be happy to happy to help you. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm gonna stop the recording. All right. All right. See.